Sports Matters TV, bringing the sports home. Okay guys, welcome to Sports Matters TV. I'm in Cork, Roy is in uh, Australia at the moment, uh, the lucky bugger. But uh, Roy, how's things with you my friend, all is good? All is good, yeah, I can't complain. Look, it's, uh, it's difficult for everyone at the moment with the coronavirus, everything has kind of been flipped on its head. But uh, yeah. yeah, we're fine, family's healthy, happy, can't complain. That's good. And you've had an incredible couple of uh, seasons out in Australia at the moment, uh, scoring plenty of goals. Uh, you obviously like the heat, Roy. <laughs> I do. I do. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think with my uh, complexion, but uh, I do I do enjoy Australia. I do enjoy the, the challenge out here, and uh, I've always enjoyed scoring goals, so I won't oh, claim that one. No better boy. Roy, tell us how it all started for you first day, like back in Cork in the, the, the early youth days. Uh, who, who, what was, it, what was, was your first club? Was it Blarney Street, or was it everything, or was it... No, oh uh, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I'm from the north side of Cork, but uh, I played for um, Leeds for oh, the majority. I played, and I played just before I went to England uh, in my teenage years. I played for Blarney for a year. You're right there, but um, yeah, I played for Leeds most of the time. And, and Leeds at that time uh, was a very, very successful youth club. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I remember one year we won every single uh, Cork School by League from from 11s to 16s. Cups, every Leeds team was probably in a cup final, you know what I mean? So there was a abundance of talent uh, all over Cork, but it seemed to really be Leeds at that, at that moment in time. And I, I was lucky enough to be to be part of it at the time. And I, uh, you know, the small kid, I was a little bit behind the, uh, the curve in, in growth wise, but I was quick yeah. and I could score goals. And uh, I suppose I could, I could hold my own as well. I had a little bit of. Um, I suppose, a little bit of desire about me. Of course. And what was it like to make that transition right over to England? Obviously not too far across the sea, but obviously joining a massive club in Coventry. What was that like for you? Yeah, look, it was great. It was all I ever wanted to do. You know, I mean, from the age of eight, uh, when I first really started taking uh, football seriously, that's uh, all I wanted to do. Man United was my team. Um, any spare moment I had, I was out on the road playing football when I wasn't, down playing games the weekend with Leeds. I played for you know, both age groups, my, my own age group and in the age above. But it, as I said, when I got to 15 and I signed for Coventry, uh, I left school uh, just after my junior cert. Um, and I suppose my parents weren't, look, they weren't, they weren't delighted that I was leaving home. First of all, they weren't delighted that I was going, not going to be doing my leaving cert. But they knew how dedicated and how stubborn I was and you know I think it was my, that was my that was my chance you know yeah. uh, looking back for all of us now my parents and myself included probably all agree that it's probably too soon yeah. I still had a little bit of uh, growing up as a person uh, and a football player to be to be done as well but uh, you know at that time we didn't know any better um, you know no, nobody nobody in my family had played uh, football or p- played professional sport before, um, and you know it was an opportunity of a lifetime. And okay, okay, I learned a lot from it, but uh, again, it was uh, it was difficult. The homesickness and all that. I, I won't lie to you. The first the first year was was quite difficult. Yeah, and obviously, uh, like you know, you always hear the stories of uh, you know the, the the Irish lad going across Channel and the tackles ahead are obviously it's 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 kind of a different game. Did you find a big difference in pace and stuff from that early age up? Uh, look, I found no difference in pace of the game really because it was talented players coming from all their areas. So we had Italians, Swedish lads, we had a load of Irish lads, very talented Irish boys. Yeah. But what it, what, it, what it was was very competitive. You, you had 20 guys in the 17s, 20 guys in the 19s, yeah. and they all want to make it. They all want to be the next big thing, you know. So I'm coming from the north side of Cork where I was, okay. you know, scoring 80 goals a season in the school by league and I was Roy Maradona and you know I had a bit of profile already going away yeah. uh, to, by the time I got to to England you know uh, it was a bit of a land you know everybody has their own backstory and everybody's super talented so yeah. it was uh, yeah it was usually challenging usually demanding but the real the real challenge was um, you know just being away from your family being away from your friends that normality um, and really like I mean this is going back to the black and white days now, but there was only a pay phone, there was no Skype, yeah. there was no FaceTime, there wasn't really mobile phones, so, uh, you know, you had to wait for your turn on the pay phone in the evening, and, you know, so you could have your turn to cry to your parents on the phone, and missing home, and all that, like, you know. Yeah, and luckily, we were lucky to get you back to Cork, and uh, it was 2005, you came to Cork City, where, 
you know, history was made. Uh, what was it like to, to get back to your home club and obviously make history with such probably the biggest and the best Cork City squad there ever was? Well, I'm sure the lads would be delighted you said that, but um, it was look, it was fantastic for me. It was a great grounding for me. Uh, couldn't happen at a better time. Obviously, I left, I left Coventry at 18, going on 19. Um, physically, I'd had a growth. You know, I'd worked hard. I'd learned, I'd learned a lot about you know the cultural business of football. Yeah. But I was coming back to Cork City hungry, um, and not just my mum's cooking. I was hungry to do well at Cork City, uh, and, and thankfully, look, I, I joined a team. That was was going places. There was a lot of talent. You, I know. I, even then, I was I was always Cork City fan growing up. So, but there was a bit of hype around the place. Pat Dolan had had got the team so far, and or three and all four great European runs and that. And uh, George O'Callaghan and John O'Flynn yeah. uh, had had come back to Cork, and they reignited people's passion in the city. And it was you know you know what Cork is like. People start talking about it again. And you know I was lucky. I I, I got to play with some some really great players. Like Joe Gamble. Came back not long before me, and then you had the, the likes of uh, you know Dan Murray and and Danny Murphy and Liam Carey, the really really top top players, you know. So uh, I was lucky. I was the young buck breaking through. They needed a bit of pace. I I, I came up with the odd goal, yeah. and uh, I loved it. We you know we, we had a lot of success. We won the league that first year. Yeah. A few cup finals. We were a little bit unfortunate with, but uh, success and we had some good European runs. But really. The guys and, and the professionalism, they really taught me a lot about what it's like to be a footballer and what it's like to be, you know, a good bloke on and off the field. And, and Damien Richardson has, has a big, you know, a big, big part to play in my career. And he was a, just a great time. And you meet people in your life yeah. that have a, have a real impact on it. And, and Damien was someone had a huge impact on it. I'd say Rico was quite stressed when all the offers came knocking for you, uh, Roy. You had, um, I remember watching the Echo and all the papers and you had so many clubs interested but you made that move to Sunderland. There was a certain man after your signature. But obviously to get back to England, it was obviously another big goal of yours to uh, to make a name over there again. It was, look. And it was difficult because, you know, when I first came out to Cork City and I played a few games and it was fantastic. I loved, I loved the lads as well and the fans. It was great. I was thinking to myself, I could play for Cork City forever. I'd love it. You know, it's, it's brilliant. The League of Ireland is going place. It's professional. And, uh, you know... Cork City were, were redeveloping the turn of cross, you know, the, the old shed was coming down, we building a bigger one, they wanted more fans in the ground. Yeah. Considering when we won the league at turn of cross, there was 13 or 14,000 people there. I thought, you know, there's, there's really is, there's something here, there's something happening here in, in League of Ireland. But, uh, you know, I had that ambition. I, I was still young. Uh, I wasn't even, I think it was 20, 21. Yeah. Um, I, had, I had the opportunity to go back to England then. As you said, there was a few clubs and I was going to sign for Fulham yeah. uh, and Roy Keane rang me up pretty much as I agreed to sign for Fulham and I, I couldn't say no. Uh, I'd be afraid to say no anyway, but no, uh, it, was, it was a great opportunity and he was, he was a great bloke and they had the Irish influence there with, with Roy, with Niall Quinn and, and all you know all the Irish players that were there at the time. You had the likes of Liam Miller, God rest him now, and, and Ian Hart and, and Darren Murphy and, and really good Irish lads that I thought would be a good fit for me, you know, yeah. at, at the time. And, um, yeah, look, it was great to play for Cork City, but, uh, yeah, look, it was difficult to leave Rico, leave the boys, but it was just part of my progression. And, um, it, yeah, it was good to work under Roy. He was a, a really good guy. And I always remember, uh, obviously, watching, you know, the whole, you know, the, you know when you go away for pre-season and stuff, I think you were out in Portugal or Spain, you know, there was always, you know, the, the big intense training camps, Roy Keane watching. Uh, is he that intense uh, while, while watching he train as well? Obviously, he's he's dedicated, he's passionate. Oh, yeah. He's, look, he's passionate. No doubt about it. You only have to watch Sky Sports to, to see what his principles are on, on football and life in general. But you can see as well, he's got a great sense of humour. I found him to be a, a very honest, positive person. Yeah. Uh, most of the things he said to you were really positive. I, I found with, with me, you know, you're doing well, you can do this better. You're, you're doing really well. Uh, I'm enjoying watching your progress. Uh, can you work on this? You know, it was never. You know, people say he was he was intense. Yeah, he was intense to work for yeah. because he wanted every training session to almost mimic the game. But that's to get the best out of people. I think he he he, he had a kind of um, an allergy to losing. Yeah. So when people think it, when people think about him, you know, losing his temper and losing the rag, uh, they think of the angry part, but they don't see. You know all all the good stuff. The motivator. I haven't seen many better motivators before the game yeah. to get the lads going. 
I haven't seen many people that don't miss a thing on the sideline. You know, you see a lot of coaches now and they have the iPads out and they're making notes. He didn't take any notes. There was no iPads. Yeah. But he came in at half time and he, he said three or four points. And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, yeah, he, he's spot on there. He hasn't he hasn't miss, missed much there, like you know. But uh, no, look, a good a, a good story, really. I suppose about him would be like to to describe. You know, you're talking about a fair factor and, and an intenseness. Yeah. It was our first year in the Premier League, you know, and uh, he was like, you know, serious now. Just before the season started, like you know, I don't want any autograph hunters. You know, we're we're here. Uh, we're a Premier League team. We're here to compete. You know, we've got two arms, two legs, the same as all. The Cristiano Ronaldo, the Wayne Rooney's are going to come up against. Yeah. So look, I don't want anyone uh, swapping shirts, you know. And um, you know, you're just as good as they are. I want us to kind of act like that. So I'm kind of looking around, and the, the, the dressing room is, is quiet. Like, and I'm thinking, yes, like spot on, like proper order, like it's proper order as well, you know. Yeah. And I'm thinking about like, you know, Scott Keane saying he's going to have a bit of fear factor. Like, and people talk about oh, we have, were the players afraid of him. Uh, and they definitely had a respect for him, but, um, you know, a long story short, a couple of months later, I was around one of the lads' house, you know, and uh, he had a three-story house, you know, a big house, and he opened the door, and he had a spiral staircase up the three floors, and as you go into the hall, you could see everything, and there up on the wall, the whole way up he had, Drogba, Shearer, whoever, McManaman and Fowler, Henri, the whole way up, so I said, Muggins here, missed the trick by getting a chance to, to get one of the big dogs shirt, but... Uh, you know, so they weren't that afraid of him. They were getting the kit man to get the thing on the slice. Oh, so he, uh, they, you know, they, they they were respectful of him. So there was there wasn't that fear factor that people probably are always looking for that that scary Roy Keane story. Okay. There was a loophole. And t- speaking of the Premier League, Roy, I always remember your game against Liverpool, against Chelsea. You were playing against the best players in the world. What was that in? You know, what was that like? You know, day in and day out. Obviously, it was incredible. It was probably you know all the dreams coming true all at once. A real. It was. Look, it was a very special time in my career, um, and you know, I went. I came over from League of Ireland, and, and, and I felt confident about that. I thought the League of Ireland was in a really good place. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the, as I said earlier, the competitiveness and training, and we had like thirty-five established players, most of whom were internationals or won Champions Leagues at Man United with the connection with Roy. And so, really top players I was playing against every day in training. Yeah. But as the season went on, you know. After the initial shock of being in the big time here, um, I, I felt I got better, I got stronger, I got fitter, I got you know more accustomed to the the kind of hustle and bustle of the Premier League. And as you said, you know I played some of the best football against the, the Liverpool's when I got a chance and, and Chelsea's. And uh, I, like my only my only probably wish is I, I had a bit longer to do it, but yeah. you know to, to to play against these guys that you know you watched on match of the day your whole life, and, and it, was, it was my goal, it was my ambition. I, I hope it would last forever, you know, and, and I really, you know, I really had a, had a taste for that one year. I probably made close to 20 appearances in the Premier League. Probably not enough starts, I think a handful of starts. Yeah. But it was outstanding just to come out to the like, full stadiums, you know, your Anfields and um, wherever, your Upton Parks, your, your Goodison Parks and full stadiums, the music's playing and you're, you're lining up. Or you, Roy brought me on against Man United and, and you know, I'm, I'm coming on and Ronaldo's coming off. Um, and then you're you're chasing Wayne Rooney back seventy yards. I'm on the wing, and you're thinking to yourself, Wayne Rooney carries a bit of weight or whatever, and he gets the ball on the edge of our box, yeah. and he sprints seventy yards with it. And I'm in quite quick, like, and I chase him all the way, and I'm thinking to myself, this fella still has a yard here, like, so yeah. it just goes to show the, the the levels that you're playing against. But uh, yeah, as I said, it was it was outstanding. I really enjoyed it, and you know, uh, um, as I said, I, I wish it went on for a, a lot longer. And like you, you, what, how did the Australia move come about? Because I remember when you, you, you were in the UK, uh, there was a couple of loan spells. There was talks you were going to go to America or go to Australia. But obviously, the Australian route was the way you went. How did that come about? And obviously, there's no regrets because you've dominated the league for, for the best part of five years now. Yeah, look, you're, you're right. There, there, is, there is no regrets, really. It was the right move for me. But uh, really, how it happened was I got a, originally... I always wanted to play abroad and, and America and Australia. I always liked the idea of being able to play a good level of football and have a good lifestyle. I felt in England, even if you're playing in the Premier League, the football is brilliant, the training is great. You finish at 12 o'clock and, you know, it, it's it's lashing rain, it, it, it's, it's quite a miserable. But if you're not in the team, you're injured, whatever, it, it's, it's hard. Yeah. I, I wanted a better life balance for, for myself and for my family. Yeah. And I always just thought America, Australia was going to give me that, but... 
long story short, you know, um, I had a phone call out of the blue from George O'Callaghan, who got into agency work. I was about 28. And he said, they're looking for a marquee player in Asia in a, a team called uh, Brunei DPMM, yeah. who are owned by the Sultan of Brunei. Uh, would you be interested? I'm thinking to myself, 28, a bit young, but I do want to play abroad. And I, I hummed and hawed about it. And in fairness to George, he was persistent. Yeah. And he kept ringing. And, and to be fair... I had a great relationship with Eddie Boothroyd, who I worked for a few times in England. Yeah. But he had just lost his job at the last club I was at in England, which was Northampton. We we went from playoff finalists at Wembley to three or four months later, uh, struggling for results. And he lost his job. And actually kind of forced my hand a little bit. I was just come back from a long-term injury. Yeah. And George said, basically, look, this is the January window. You get an opportunity to play from February to October. Go over there, score goals. Come back to England, we'll get you back to England and uh, kick on again. You're still a great age, you know, you're in the prime of your life, blah, blah, blah. But when I got, when I got away, I moved over there. Joe Gamble, he got Joe Gamble over there as well as one of the foreign players. I just opened my eyes just to, you know, how, what what more is out there? There's, there's so many countries to play football at a really good level. And it's just something different. Again, it got me used to the heat playing in, in, in Brunei for the year. Because yeah. uh, in the middle of Malaysia and Borneo. And it, the humidity level it was so hot. We used to train at night time. Yeah. Uh, Steve Keane was the manager who used to manage Blackburn Rovers, who was fantastic. Joe, obviously, being one of the best buddies, was great. So we uh, got a good lifestyle going and look, really enjoyed it. And um, that's kind of how Australia came about. I kind of, George got on to me midway through the season. Do you want to go back to England now? There's, there's a bit of interest. You know, I scored 26 goals that year. And I said, to be honest, no. Yeah. I don't. I want to do something else. And they had been a few other people on to me, a few uh, agents, whatever. And yeah, Australia was one that jumped out at me, and uh, it came about. And, and I'm glad I made the move. I'm glad I moved, made the move. Whatever, nearly over four years ago now. And um, yeah. I've been here ever since. And I, look, I love the football. I love the lifestyle. It challenges me in, in so many different ways. But um, yeah, so look, it, it just suits me really. Definitely, and you're definitely the marquee figure out there. We're always seeing, you know, when I'm on Instagram, Facebook, you know, you're always the marquee figure. Obviously, the style out there is incredible, but the the standard is, is huge. Like Australian football, is it's incredible. What's it like to, to play with Newcastle Jets? Obviously, a huge club, and they were happy to get you back. So I know you went, uh, you were with Robbie Fowler for a while, but you, you made your way back to Newcastle Jets, thank God. I did, yeah. Look, I went, uh, I didn't want to leave Newcastle in the first place. I have a great relationship here. I'm one of their all time top goal scorers, and um, basically, long story short, uh, contract negotiations broke down the back end of last year. Yeah. And Robbie Fowler, the Robbie Fowler effect was happening in Brisbane Road, who were a big club as well, and, and it kind of forced my hand. Yeah. Uh, I was just first signing in there. And, you know, to be honest with you, all was going quite well. Uh, I scored seven goals in my first 11 starts at Brisbane Road, so it wasn't bad. I carried on doing what I was doing. But the style of football that Robbie wanted to play, and he kind of wanted a lot more structured, and he wanted kind of a more of a kind of a, a number 10 slash kind of um, hold up link up player and, and I've always been some of the players on the shoulder yeah. uh, don't get me wrong I get involved in the build up play and do my bits and pieces but I mostly want to be a nuisance defenders in behind and, and greedy I want to get in the box and score goals all the time and he, he wanted more and to be honest with you really, we had a conversation and I said the energy is not right for me yeah. Newcastle Jets want me back and uh, yeah Newcastle Jets at the time Wes Ulham has come back from injury Carl Robinson who I would have followed a lot as a player and he um, had a great spell in the MLS uh, as a coach and uh, Joe Ledley was coming in for, who used to play for Celtic and Crystal Park there was good things happening back at Newcastle Jets and uh, they were close to my heart and I, when I came back yeah it's all, it's all worked out pretty well I've been scoring goals again the fans took me back with open arms yeah. and uh, yeah I'm loving football and before the coronavirus we were on a really good run we we hadn't hadn't lost many games. I think we only lost one game since uh, the turn of the year. Yeah, and um, yeah, we, we, it's, it's a good place to, to live, and it's a great place to play football. Do you reckon Roy will ever get you home at some stage in a, in a couple of years? You're still young. Do you reckon we'll ever get yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I look to give you the honest answer. I would love to. Yeah. To, to give you the, I'd love. I'd love to yeah. wear the Cox jersey again at some stage, and that's being genuine. But the, the, the truth of it is, I've got a family, and yeah. my boy's going to be going to school. Uh, we've got a house there, we're kind of settled there. Yeah. So how that would ever work, I'm not sure, but uh, never say never. Never say never, because strange things have happened. Like, 
you know, I, I made plans uh, in, in football and uh, I don't think they've worked out uh, ever to plan. So yeah. why, why start making them now? Definitely. Hopefully we'll get you back at some stage, but I wouldn't blame you for staying in Australia, right, to be honest. I wouldn't blame you one bit. Life was good out there. And uh, what's the yeah. plans... What's the plans, Roy, with, um, obviously, any word in the league start back up, obviously, is it just um, time will tell? Yeah, at the moment, yeah, at the moment, um, even though the coronavirus here is well under control and the restrictions are being lifted now, uh, we can go back and have our barbecues again and all that kind of carry on. Uh, it's penciled in for 1st of August to games to start again, which is the safe route, I think. We could probably, the rugby league is, is going back at the end of May. Uh, and the Aussie rules in June, so realistically we could probably follow suit with them. But they're going into um, coronavirus hubs, so yeah. they, they basically have a training base, a hotel. They go from hotel to training base, and they try and play out their season. We we're a little bit different. We've only got uh, four games left and a playoffs kind of final series. Yeah. So we're waiting till August, and we're going to try and get through the games in August. But. Um, you know, proper order to it. It's about health and safety of, of not just Australia, but the human race at the moment. It, it, it's chaos, you know. So, um, you know, when it happens, we'll be ready for it. And, and you know, the, the beauty of it, we've been able to, to keep fit. Okay, fit. Okay, we're fit. Okay, we're nice. Okay, we're nice. Okay, we're nice yeah. uh, every year I go with, with one, of my, one or two of my teammates, now that the restrictions have been lifted, I've been going for a run with uh, Wes Houlihan. Oh, yeah. We have a little bit of crack every day and do a bit of work as well. So, it's, it's you know, it's, it's been good. But uh, yeah, yeah be, I think it's good for everybody when when live sport is back. I think we all, even though it's been difficult, I think live sport is what people need at the moment. They need that little bit of a lift, and it plays an important um, role, you know. Definitely. And last one, right? We just have to ask for all the young lads out there in Cork, around the streets of Blarney Street, Knockinheeny, you know, Mahin, all the parts of Cork. What advice can you give to them, Roy? Obviously, they're all looking to to make a name. It's obviously heard. You know, they're all hoping to get that dream moved to England or elsewhere. What advice can you give to them? Well, look, it's it's very it's very simple. Uh, if you want something enough and you've got a desire to do it, you've got to work hard and you got to keep working hard. Um, with that hard hard work and the right attitude, you're also going to get a lot of knockbacks, and you'll keep getting them. You'll keep getting them. But the best people and the best players are the ones that get knocked down and keep getting back up. Because it's, you know that's that's what gets you longevity in sport, and uh, you know I've been knocked down a few times, but I, I'm still here, I'm still standing. So that's the that's the beauty of sport. That's that's what it's all about: learning from your your defeats and and moving forward. And uh, I've been very lucky. I get to to you know live my dream. It's my passion to play football, and it's not always easy and and, and you know rosy, but uh, it's, it's it's a great job. And if uh, if any kids out there really want to do it. Put your mind to it and you'll achieve it. Right, it means a lot, my man. We'll, uh, we'll touch base with you in a couple of months. And as always, we'll be supporting you as soon as the league starts back up and stuff. But uh, thanks for taking the time to speak to us today. It means a lot, bud. No worries, buddy. Anytime.